年是中美建交四十周年，呃，在现在中美的这种大环境下，您您对中美未来的关系有什么展望或者有什么建议？关系呢，我也比较我比较悲观，这个长期我乐观了，呃，两国呢共同利益很多。呃，早晚要重新发现这一点。嗯，那么我想，中国方面，呃，最重要的是，呃，他要维持，呃，过去美国创造的国际体系，对他有利。美国要是撤出来的话，是美国的错误，中国不应该犯同样的错误。就这样。嗯，谢谢您。Okay, 谢谢。Holmes, the great American jurist, observed that the life of the law has not been logic, it has been experience. The same can be said for diplomacy. We are fortunate to have with us this evening one of America's most experienced diplomats. There are few experts more qualified to speak on the topic of U.S.-Sino relations than Ambassador Chaz Freeman. Ambassador Freeman's career spans the reach of the U.S. government in roles including Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia, DCM in Beijing, and in Bangkok. Among Ambassador Freeman's most striking contributions to U.S. diplomacy was his role in the normalization of relations between the U.S. and China. After entering the U.S. Foreign Service in 1965, Ambassador Freeman dedicated years to studying Mandarin and writing policy briefs on China. In 1972, while serving as an officer on the China desk, he was assigned as the principal American interpreter during President Nixon's historic visit to China. As a former interpreter myself, at least for three months during my college career at the U.S. Embassy in Senegal, French to English, I can readily attest to the difficulty of that job. It was probably the hardest job I ever held so I can't imagine the pressure you were under on, on, on that occasion. Ambassador Freeman is currently a senior fellow at Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. He is the author of numerous books and publications and frequently speaks on the state of Sino-American relations and the importance of our nation's diplomatic service. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ambassador Chaz Freeman. Good evening. Uh, thank you all very much for that very kind introduction. Um, getting up here, I'm reminded of uh, a friend of mine who is uh, also a friend of the Nobel Prize winner. Um, Linus Pauling. Uh, Linus Pauling won two Nobel Prizes, one for chemistry and one for peace. And when he was in his 90s, uh, my friend asked him, what's the secret of long life? And uh, expecting to hear a lecture on vitamin C. Um, and instead, Linus Pauling said, never let go of the handrail. <laughs> so, so I appreciate the hands on the uh, We Americans are, make, are making uh, Quite an effort at making xenophobia great again. <laughs> Every day now brings us reminders that there are few phenomena as discomforting as the sight of the American people in one of our periodic fits of nativism. Contemporary know-nothingism is enriched by the guesstimates, conjectures, a priori reasoning from dubious assumptions and media-generated hallucinations that populate our social and niche media. And these fantasies now largely star China, along with a cast of lesser demons 
Russia, Iran, and Cuba, all of whom are said to have recently taken up residence in Venezuela. Uh, that is, of course, a socialist snot bag, a mere 1,600 miles south of our shores. And it's famous for its beautiful women, and not terribly credible as an enemy, unless you invade it. We'll see. But finally, in China, we Americans have a cure for enemy deprivation syndrome. <laughs> that is the sick feeling that affects military industrial complexes when their adversaries unexpectedly throw in the towel, leaving them without the diabolical enemy to keep them in shape and in the money. The Soviet Union's dead, but China is having a comeback. <coughs> Praise the Lord, pass the ammunition and the cash, too. Sadly, however, Moscow's surprise default on its Cold War contest with Washington is not a reliable predictor of how a struggle with Beijing will turn out. If you've seen one communist, you haven't seen them all. <laughs> Unlike Russian Marxism-Leninism, East Asian market-Leninism works. Rather than collapsing, China is more likely to continue to gain in wealth and power, and Washington's policies seem designed to ensure that China's rise benefits U.S. defense budgets much more than American companies, consumers, and technologists. No one can be sure how fast or how steadily China will rise, but it seems destined in due course to resume the preeminent position on the planet that it enjoyed for millennia before Europeans, Japanese, and Americans humiliated in the 19th and uh, the first half of the 20th century. That means that China will displace the United States from the international primacy our countries enjoyed over most of the past 140 years when we became the world's largest economy. No longer unmatched, Americans will have to engage and share power including with Chinese and others previously under the Western thumb. China's been guilty of some very objectionable behavior, including the sometimes brazen theft of corporate intellectual property. But as Stephen Verheim, a historian at Columbia University, put it in the last Sunday's New York Times, the anti-China turn of the last year has been triggered more by American anxieties than by Chinese actions. American Sinophobia has at least as much to do with the factors that fuel populism in U.S. politics as it does with China's transgressions. Many Americans feel slighted by the well-to-do elites who govern them and run the banks and corporations that dominate the U.S. economy. Americans of all ethnicities resent the collapse of social mobility in the United States. The concentration, the concentration of wealth in one percent, the stagnant or declining standards of living that they are experiencing, and the obscene extent to which U.S. corporate and financial elite now feathers its own nest. They blame that elite for abolishing low-paying industrial jobs and transferring them to workers overseas. Lower middle-class Euro-Americans are particularly unnerved by their imminent reduction to minority status in an America whose leaders often no longer look like them. They are angered by political correctness that protects every other sort of American from inadvertent offense, while dismissing them and their beliefs as deplorable. A vulnerable demagogue that attributes their distress selfish corporate collusion with China. Blaming China for their distress may alleviate. Sadly, it will not fix it. The combination of domestic malaise and the ongoing eclipse of our international authority is a severe strain on the American psyche. It's also a test of American resilience, realism, and willpower. We know we must reform and redirect tax, investment, labor management relations 
and education policies to reinvigorate America. Some insist on calling this challenge a threat and fighting the scenario rather than coping with it. They imagine that China must long to dominate the world as the United States has since World War II. But when you take the time to listen to what Chinese say among themselves about their aspirations, it appears what they want is respect and a bit of courteous consideration by formerly scornful foreigners like their ancestors before them. They demand a status of dignity that induces others to let them prosper in domestic tranquility. Americans' difficulties with this demand arise from China having become rich and strong enough to have stopped kowtowing to US regional and global primacy. The Chinese no longer see doing so as an acceptable price for being left alone what they want. It doesn't help that in a unique combination of paranoia and complacency, the United States seems determined to retain its supremacy, not by correcting our own deficiencies, but by tripping up and immobilizing China. While insisting that China become more open, America is itself becoming more closed. This is an inauspicious dynamic. The chances that the United States will either leave China alone or that Americans can retain global dominance by crippling China are poor and non-existent. Attempting to bring China down is more likely to weaken and impoverish America than to halt China's advance. So what's now in prospect in South American relations? Let me begin by agreeing with the key element of the piece Jeremy Paul Holt wrote for the 2019 Great Decisions Program. GDP does indeed fail to compare like with like in ways that are relevant to international competition. It tells us nothing about how economic activity is distributed. It misses something important when it equates the value added by ditch diggers or buck passing financial engineers to additions to national capital by steel workers or Nobel Prize winner. GDP has its uses as a, an index of gross economic size and rates of, of growth, but it doesn't predict much, if anything, about how a contest will turn out. Relative economic size is not, is not irrelevant, but national fervor, pride, will, and stamina determine how important it is. When Japan attempted to cripple American military <coughs> power in the Pacific in 19, in its, with its December 7, 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor, its GDP was barely one-tenth that of the United States. And yet Japan held the United States at bay for nearly four years succumbing at last only to nuclear attacks, it could not then answer in kind. So whether stated at nominal exchange rates or in purchasing power parity, PPP, comparisons of economic indicators, gross economic indicators between China and America are mostly beside the point. It is far more relevant that Chinese industrial production, now a fourth of the world's total, is over one and a half times that of the United States, more than America, Germany, and South Korea combined. And it matters that the Chinese workforce involved in so-called STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics work, is already one-fourth of the world's, eight times larger than America's, and growing more than three times as fast. It probably is also an advantage that China, unlike the United States or the late unlamented Soviet Union, is not ideologically messianic. Chinese do not seem to give a hoot how foreigners govern ourselves, although they are, of course, flattered if non-Chinese seek to emulate them. China is for autocracy at home, 
propagandistic assertions by American ideologues notwithstanding, it does not push autocracy or oppose democracy abroad. The Cold War is long over, and the new world disorder that has succeeded it. Ideological alignments are weak to non-existent. The appeal of systems of government depends almost entirely on how well they deliver effective leadership, prosperity, and domestic tranquility to those they govern. And countries can no longer be forced into allegiance to particular great powers. They're free to choose their own international partnerships and rivalries and to deal with their foreign partners and adversaries <coughs> issue by issue. Without exception, China's neighbors are apprehensive about the degree to which its rising wealth and power will require them to defer to it. But none fears invasion by China. Despite American efforts to imagine one, there is no Fulda gap in the East, with East Asian maritime characteristics. Overwrought American threat mongering about China is selling much better at home than abroad. Even in countries traditionally suspicious of China, it has little traction, perhaps because they see no benefit and considerable harm from yielding to US pressure to choose between China and the United States, tempering alarmism with sycophantic presidential flattery of Xi Jinping and other autocrats is not turning out to be much of a substitute for diplomacy. China is the largest trading partner of all of its neighbors. It's becoming their biggest source and destination for investment. It's in their region. It's not going away. They don't want to pick a fight with it. And they won't join the United States in doing so. China has century-old claims to islets, rocks, and reefs in the East and South China Sea. Other claimants to these seas, most of them, during the Cold War, when China was contained by the United States. Thirty years ago, China finally accepted, occupied the few land features that other claimants had not grabbed. For their part, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Vietnam do not seek to dislodge China from the strongholds it has built to establish an immovable presence alongside them. Despite differences with the United States Navy over how to draw territorial baselines, borders, around its bastions, China does not threaten the freedom of commercial navigation in the South China Sea. After all, two-thirds of the shipping there is en route to or from China or on Chinese ships. It's hard to ignore these facts unless the prejudicial narratives of the American media miasma prevent one from seeing them. China makes no demands on its neighbors at present other than respectful politesse, here's the French word, um, mutual openness to trade and investment, and the avoidance of collusion with third parties in active threats to its security. Whether they're historic American allies or not, not one of China's neighbors has signed on to the current US campaign to isolate China. If you doubt that, read the speech of the Prime Minister of Singapore at the recent Shangri-La defense meeting, which is very informative. These countries want to use backing from America not to confront China, but to strike a balanced and sustainable accommodation with it. We're useful in that context. This disconnect in objectives is why the Trump administration's campaigns to ostracize China have so far been more disruptive of U.S. alliances and international partnerships that are harmful to China. Rather than curbing Chinese influence, these campaigns have undermined American leadership. Bilaterally, the current U.S.-initiated trade war has imposed immediate costs, of course, on the Chinese economy, the U.S. economy too. Chinese retaliation has done the same in the United States. American retail businesses and consumers can expect an escalating hit. The short-term effects of Trump's trade war are hard to miss. What's 
what's its long-term impact likely to be? That's a more important question, I think. For one, supply chains and trading pattern patterns are being permanently dislocated. Ironically, as Chinese producers seek to avoid U.S. tariffs by relocating to Southeast Asia, East Africa, and Latin America, they are being pushed up the value chain at home. And meanwhile, their added investments in production in other countries are boosting their influence there. Russian, Ukrainian, and other countries' agriculture is getting a big boost at the expense of American farmers. One thing that hasn't really been noticed, but I'll just say for on the side, that China has retaliated against U.S. tariffs with comparable counter tariffs in some areas. More important, while it has raised tariffs on U.S. Ex exports, it has significantly lowered tariffs on imports from other countries. So it is repositioning itself for the long term. The soybean farmers are not going to get their market back, nor are the semiconductor manufacturers. The United States has just shown China it, that it can be a remarkably fickle and unreliable trading partner. This gives the Chinese compelling arguments for buying everything elsewhere. China had been America's fastest growing export market. Washington is writing it off, even as it seeks to curtail Chinese capital flows to the United States. With Chinese companies largely unable now to invest the dollars they earn from sales of goods and services in America, uh, the Chinese government has been using these dollars to buy treasury bonds. In this way, China has subsidized the deficits and credit rollovers that the U.S. government now depends upon to stave off government shutdowns. So what might have been job and export creating Chinese and corporate investments in American infrastructure, industry, and agriculture have become passive supports for U.S. fiscal profligacy. The current trend towards Sino-American hostility puts even this symbolic relationship in jeopardy, in some, I should say, symbiotic relationship in jeopardy. If, as some predict, China is about to become a net importer rather than exporter of capital, which is something that happens as countries develop, this will make it a competitor of the United States in global sales of debt. Chinese financing of U.S. budget deficits aside. We can look at the example of Japan to get some, a sense of the opportunity that excluding Chinese investment in the U.S. private sector will impose on the U.S. economy. Japan is a U.S. ally, but in the 1980s, Japanese companies faced comparable though less formidable obstacles to investment in the United States, as in the case of China. Those opposed to Japanese investments based their objections on fanciful national security considerations. But before the flow of Japanese capital to the United States declined, it created 700,000 jobs for Americans and built factories that generate well over $60 billion in U.S. exports annually today. By both executive orders and acts of Congress, the Chinese capital that might do the same is now being directed elsewhere. America's loss is obvious gain. It isn't hard to guesstimate the effects on the U.S. economy of making investment by Chinese companies next to impossible. The United States has long attracted about 15% of the world's annual foreign direct investment, or FDI. A decade and a half ago, about that same percentage of Chinese investment overseas uh, came here in the United States. But as Washington has raised barriers to Chinese participation in the American economy, the percentage has fallen to about 2% of China's overall FDI, and it's going down. Over the same period, Europe's share of global Chinese investment has risen to over 30%. Had we not barred Chinese companies from putting their, their money to work in our economy, they would be pumping 
about $80 billion annually into expanding the U.S. private sector and creating jobs in America. Now as China ceases to export savings to us, we Americans won't see that money. We just better get our own savings rate up. The Trump, Pence, xenophobia is also reminding us that science and technology advance <coughs> they advance through collaboration, not the sequestration of knowledge. In the United States, we graduate about 650,000 scientists and engineers annually, over one third of whom, by the way, are foreigners, interestingly. In some disciplines, like engineering and computer science, foreign students account for about half of new U.S. degrees. In artificial intelligence, which is said to be key in the future, the percentage is over 60%. Almost one-third of all foreign students here are from China. If we make them unwelcome, as the Trump and the Pence administration threatens to do, they won't come here to work alongside America. If you read Bloomberg today, you will find a long story about an FBI NIH effort to expel Chinese researchers from cancer research uh, throughout the country. Now, why this is thought to be of consequence for our national security is never explained. Someone dies from cancer in the future because the cures are found in China, not here. We will regret that. Um, on its own, to return to the subject of STEM workers, on its own, China now graduates, remember we graduate 650,000, they graduate 1.8 million scientists, engineers, and mathematicians annually. China's about to take, overtake us in the number of doctorates it confers in these fields. From 2016 to 2017, the value of intellectual property grew 19% for China. It grew 10% for the United States. It's pretty clear who has the momentum in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. <coughs> By 2025, China is expected to have more technologically skilled workers than all members of the OECD combined. By severing ties with, China, with the Chinese, we Americans are isolating ourselves from the largest population of scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians in the world. Chinese corporate spending on research and development is growing at 20% annually, much faster than anywhere else. Cutting the United States off from scientific and technological intercourse with China seems much more likely to disadvantage American innovation than to retard Chinese progress. The Center American split the Trump administration has engineered has many potential consequences beyond those that I've mentioned. And I'll close by just pointing briefly out, uh, pointing a few more issues uh, for Americans to ponder uh, out, to, out to us. We're playing a game of chicken with China and the South China Sea. Backed by us, Japan is doing the same thing in the Senkaku or Kiaoyu Islands of the East China Sea. We're only one misstep away from a naval battle with China. This would be our first naval conflict since 1945, and our very first with a nuclear power. Think about it. The Chinese Civil War was suspended, not ended, by U.S. insertion of the Seventh Fleet into the Taiwan Strait in 1950, June 27, 1950. Our policies now seem to be encouraging some politicians in Taiwan to believe that they have a blank check to take actions that would almost certainly reignite that civil war. Meanwhile, we have no dialogue with the Chinese People's Liberation Army comparable to that which we had with the Soviet Army during the Cold War. And there are no mechanisms at all in place for crisis management or escalation control between Washington and Beijing. Our political military strategy for China amounts to hoping we don't get into a fight. We're well into an arms race with China. China's recently tested or fielded carrier killing ballistic missiles, rail guns, hypergliding warheads, quantum satellite communication systems, 
stealth penetrating radars, and unprecedentedly long range anti ship and air to ground missiles, to name just a few developments. In an ongoing competition, we do not seem to be winning. We're in a competition with China in space, too. So far, we're playing the role of the hare to China's tortoise. While we dream of flashy adventures on Mars, China is methodically laying the basis for the mining of the moon and asteroids to build habitats and factories at the Lagrange points, thus gravitationally stable parking places on the Earth and the moon. Uh, they apparently read Gerard O'Neill, who was a Princeton uh, professor who came up with this concept, and I guess we did. Uh, we're trying to smash China's great technology companies like Huawei, which we want to exclude from global 5G networks. But there's a good chance the Chinese tech giants drawing on China's huge domestic market and the eagerness of international markets for cheap state-of-the-art equipment will be able to dominate the world beyond our borders, even as inferior U.S. technology retreats within China, not the United States originally wanted to balkanize the global architecture of the internet, which we managed by creating nationally managed domains. Thanks to our outburst of nativism and cyber paranoia, Beijing's not getting what it wanted. The digital universe is being subdivided into sovereign departments. President Trump may or may not be making America great again, as he promised. So far, he has undone deals, not done them, and contracted, not expanded America's international reach. I'm among those who think we're better off trading what we have for what we don't have than trying to make everything ourselves. But no one can deny that the President and the America Firsters and his entourage are fundamentally altering the world he inherited. Many abroad now see the United States as a rogue superpower bent on destroying the world order earlier generations of Americans worked hard to create. The Southern American split is one of the most consequential elements of global political and technological upheaval, but it is far from the only one. A couple of decades ago, uh, Joe Nye, a professor at Harvard, observed that if the United States treated China as an enemy, it would become one. He's now being proven right. Welcome to a 21st century in which the instruments of global governance are increasingly passing from American hands. The competition between great powers is ever more cutthroat. American alliances are decaying. The U.S. ability to enlist the cooperation of other nations is declining. And despite unmatched military power, the United States has no apparent strategy for halting or reversing any of these trends. None of this should be acceptable to Americans. It reflects the replacement of the strategic deliberation with tweaked decisions generated by apparent hormonal surges in the middle of the night. The substitution of militarism, sanctions, and non-negotiable demands for mutual accommodation through international give and take, and the repudiation of courtesy in communication with foreign nations in favor of threats, insults, and temper tantrums. This approach has registered no successes. Among its notable failures, most notable failures, is the management of relations with China the world's most formidable rising power. Rather than persuading China to change objectionable policies and practices to mutual advantage, what we're doing promises not just to entrench those practices, but to exacerbate them. Outright enmity is rapidly succeeding comedy. <laughs> to be able to compete effectively with rising powers like China and resurging nations like Russia, to be able to do so with the confident optimism our country has always embodied, we must not only 
update our, our diplomacy, but the domestic policies and practices that now divide and weaken us. We have a constitutional democracy that history has shown to facilitate orderly change. To bring the immense talents and energies of the American people to bear on the unprecedented challenges our country now faces, we must adapt to new domestic as well as foreign realities. We Americans have done this before. I think we can do it again. And it's past time that we got on with it. Thank you. see the uh, execution of soft power from China as its global role expands. Uh, you've mentioned that uh, their, their approach is diffident and, and uh, uh, that they're disinterested in influencing others, but in what way do you see uh, their influence expanding in that sense? Well, they're very interested, the Chinese are very interested in soft power as a concept. Uh, it's, it's actually a rather peculiar concept. American concept. Um, and if you think about it, it's based on the assumption that the only real power there is is hard power. In other words, if you don't have brass knuckles on, you've got no ability to persuade anybody to do anything. Uh, that's obvious nonsense. But anyway, uh, soft power is a reality. It is the ability to appeal, to make others want to do things that please you, to admire you, uh, to emulate you, to follow you. Um, and, and it's very important, and the Chinese emphasize that. 
Uh, they're spending a lot of money on expanding their their reach of broad information about China, uh, explaining their viewpoints and so forth. Um, all true. Uh, I think they're going to get not very far with this. And the reason for that is, first of all, um, uh, they have an extremely unbidden political system. Um, it is occasionally guilty of true outrages like the in Xinjiang uh, surveillance state that is now in force. Um, that means that in a significant part of the world it's not going to have any appeal. Now there are other parts of the world where raw power is more respected and sought after. Um, and uh, in those cases people will be looking to China for lessons. But they won't get any help from China in exporting its system it really isn't interested in doing that. Uh, I think the Chinese secretly don't believe that foreigners can become Chinese. And they're just as happy not having them try. Um, so they're very different from us in that regard. We are very messianic. We insist that you conform to our ways if you're going to be our friend. Chinese make no such demands. That gives them a big edge in international business because they don't have political conditions or moral conditions attached uh, to transactions. Can you wait for the uh, mic? Um, thank you for being here with us, Ambassador Kramer. Um, given the economic ties between um, China and North Korea, um, how does this downturn in U.S. and China relations have any effect on Trump's uh, denuclearization dialogue with North Korea? Well, the Chinese uh, have a strong interest um, in a non-nuclear Korea for obvious reasons their neighbor, um, and also because if, if North Korea, the Democratic Republic of Mother Korea, is permitted indefinitely to retain nuclear weapons, that is likely to encourage others in the region uh, to develop nuclear weapons, including perhaps Taiwan, uh, which is, you know, a nuclear civil war is not anything the world needs to see. Um, and even Japan on occasion has flirted with the idea. So I think um, there's no doubt about the Chinese willingness to cooperate on the nuclear front. However, they have an overriding interest, um, which after all, a million Chinese perished uh, to preserve North Korea as a buffer state between them and US forces in South Korea. Um, they want stability in Korea above everything else. And they are not sympathetic to maximum pressure aimed at regime change in North Korea. So we have a difference there. And I always thought we were making a mistake when we, instead of talking to the North Koreans, you know, our basic posture was, we won't talk to you until you come out with your hands up. Um, that is not an effective approach. Um, and there was always, uh, I thought, in that context, it was a mistake try to outsource diplomacy to China because its interests are not the same as ours. It shares the interest in denuclearization, but it puts a higher priority on stability than we do. Uh, so um, the economic relationship is important mainly because North Korea doesn't have important economic relationships with anybody else. From the Chinese point of view, it's insignificant. North Korea is a small economy, it struggles, and I was very, very interested to see some commentary on the Chinese uh, internet uh, today, um, earlier, um, about um, a, a film that uh, Huawei made to with children singing about how wonderful Huawei was. Um, and um, the Chinese uh, netizens, as they call themselves, the people on the internet, um, said, my god, this is disgusting. It's just like North Korean propaganda. Get rid of it. Um, there's no love loss there. Yes? Excellent speech today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, one of the most interesting conflicts involving China is going on now. It would be hard to imagine one of every seven or eight of us on the streets facing police with tear gas and rubber bullets shooting at us 
but that's exactly what's happening in Hong Kong. Can you talk a little about what's at stake there? Hong Kong, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of times I've been in Hong Kong. Um, I always thought when uh, uh, 1997 approached and Hong Kong was to revert to Chinese sovereignty from British uh, rule. Now, by the way, the Brits never installed democracy in Hong Kong, so um, was, you know, they had 140 years to get around it. Um, the, uh, but um, I always thought it was more likely that Hong Kong was going to take over China than the other way around. And, and in many ways it did. I mean, the whole commercial culture, and even the language, uh, if you speak Mandarin, you know, it used to be a Bengal law. Now it's a Sietza, Sietza law. It's Cantonese. Um, anyway, basic uh, office building. Basic terms have been infiltrated. So the influence has been enormous. Um, what has not been uh, an influence, the Chinese have successfully kept Hong Kong's freedoms and self-rule out of contamination. The system. That's pretty remarkable. Uh, when, when Freedom House and others do ratings of societies, they just did one. Um, the free society, the, the most successful economic society on the planet is Singapore, having displaced us. Second is Hong Kong. We're number three. Uh, so Hong Kong continues to enjoy a lot of freedom. Among the freedoms it enjoys is, in the Chinese phrase, Gong Ren Chi Gong. Hong Kong people should run Hong Kong. But what Hong Kong people means is all Hong Kong oligarchs fat cats. And what these guys, their distinguishing feature, my, some of them are my friends, so I probably shouldn't say this, but um, their distinguishing feature is that they're expert at preemptive communication. Um, they intuit what they think Beijing might want or should want, and then they offer it. And the extradition law, which is the subject of the uh, riots, uh, apparently originated in Hong Kong, not on the mainland. So um, this is a hard thing. Nobody's ever tried one country, two systems before. Actually, there are three. There's one part of China that's run by Shelton Davis. And, you know, and if Taiwan ever reunites with the mainland, though, before. Uh, nobody's ever done this before. Nobody's ever run a country of 1.4 billion people before. Um, so it's very disturbing. Uh, I have to say that in the end, um, people will cut their senses and back off on both sides. Uh, yes? In your 2012 book, Interesting Times, you pointed out how uh, the United States was able to establish relations with China because uh, they put aside their differences in lives and beliefs and just focus on the balance of power with the uh, Soviet sort of, sort of Union. And then you indicated that after 1989, Tiananmen Square, um, Americans tend to focus more on, um, they, 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 they start they, they care too much about the people, they start focusing on uh, whether the human rights in China and that we, as if we should just focus on the balance of power. And now it seems that the foreign policy is shifting more towards balance of power. Don't, inter don't interfere in other uh, countries. Just you know, if, if they have uh, different uh, ways of doing things, just let that go and focus on the balance of power. Could you kind of describe how the foreign policy has evolved in those terms? Um, Nixon and Kissinger really were quite un-American in their um, focus on the European balance of power as a model for international relations. And, um, and they very successfully applied the lessons of Kissinger's doctoral, I guess it was his, maybe it was an undergraduate dissertation, uh, A World Restored. It's a great book about the European balance of power and Metternich and so forth. And the main, one of the main lessons in it is that after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the victors made the decision to invite the defeated. France into the Council of Europe, the Concert of Europe, become a participant in managing Europe, 
and thereby pull the fangs of the French Revolution and tame France. Um, and indeed, that gave the world, that gave Europe about 100 years of peace. Uh, we made a mistake after World War I. We excluded Germany from any role, and that didn't work out too well. And we also acquiesced in the Bolsheviks' self-exclusion, which also didn't work out too well. Um, so they wanted to include China in the global system, and in effect, uh, make it part of the governing council of the world rather than outside threatening. And that worked. Um, and in order to do that, in the Shanghai Communique, which is a very unusual document, um, uh, it begins with five or six pages, which I remember interpreting um, to this day, of violent disagreements between the United States and China over everything from what was going on in Indochina at the time to Korea, to Japan's role in Asia, to Kashmir. We didn't agree about anything. We had to state that for a very obvious reason, that all of our friends, Chinese friends and our friends, were concerned that we might sell them out. And by de dramatizing our differences, we demonstrated we weren't. And that enabled us to go on and say, notwithstanding all these differences and the different socioeconomic systems in the two countries, um, there are some things we can cooperate on, and among those is blocking an effort by anyone to achieve hegemony. Anyone in this case, meaning the Soviet Union, with maybe Japan also there as a historical memory. So that was a very effective way of defanging the normal American impulse to insist that everybody conform to our values. We just set it aside. And we were doing that. After the end of the Cold War, there was a mood in this country uh, which refuted uh, President Kennedy's remark. I remember one, one occasion he said, you know, if I make a mistake in domestic policy, it can embarrass me. But if I make a mistake in foreign policy, we could all die. And there was a sense of consequence about foreign policy. It meant that you didn't screw around with it. Um, you, took, you were careful. You didn't assert special interests, vested interests tried to assert a national interest. That disappeared after the Cold War. We were full of ourselves. Um, and we thought, foreign policy, yeah, who cares? So um, we franchised, we started foreign policy by franchise. So the Black Caucus got Haiti for no reason other than that Haitians are African descent. They saved the Wales crowd, crowd got Norway because you know, Norway from Wales. And, uh, the non-proliferators got the Soviet and ex-Soviet Union, so forth and so on. And um, with China, we did multiple franchises. Religious freedom, human rights, um, you know, the trade issues, this, that, you know, and um, it all got very confused. And if you don't have an effective structure of government that can take all of these disparate interests, which are real and need to be attended to, and somehow synthesize them and come up with a national vision, then you get the kind of confusion we now have. So um, I think this is an evolution in our polity that is not complete yet. Um, and um, it makes it very, very difficult for anybody to deal with us because they don't know where we're coming from. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> I'd agree with that, um, but I'd also say that um, 
with great difficulty and probably unconstitutionally, the Obama administration agreed to the Paris Climate Accord. Um, this is not a problem that can be tackled by a single country. It requires the cooperation of all. China actually, in many ways, has been doing a lot more than the United States. Of course, it very quickly became a larger polluter than, than the United States. Uh, but it is making real progress in cutting that, that back. I think it's positively criminal to suspend cooperation on this issue. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, one of the reasons I try to stress science and technology a bit is not only because I believe that free exchange of ideas is the key to our national greatness. We are always open to ideas and people. And if we become close to ideas and people, that hurts us more than it hurts anybody else. So I believe that. But another reason is um, I see a great deal more interest in superheroes than I do in science. Fits. Um, in this country. How, and, you know, the fact that more Americans are not taking that step for uh, work is a symptom of a national mood that's gone off in a more kind of less scientific, less technologically oriented direction. And in that kind of atmosphere, climate denial can, can exist and it does. And, you know, it's the official position of the Trump administration that it's a hoax. And they are actually preventing government departments from writing scientific reports that document climate change. And yet I sit in Rhode Island at the house where I was a little kid back in the mid-40s, and I can see that the water level in the bay is a foot higher than it was. Uh, something's happening. Do we have time for, we have time for one more question? Sir. Uh, sir. In the South China Sea, yeah. man-made islands are being built by the Chinese. Right. They're kind of taking over the whole area. And this is what has been called in some periodical the shadow war. In the sense of taking command without ever firing a weapon. Is there any reality for that? Since America just sitting by and watching. Those islands in the South China Sea and the South China Sea itself um, in the pre-modern period when Chinese and other Asians did not endorse the European idea of sovereignty. Sovereignty in the European concept applies to land and territory. In the Asian concept, uh, what mattered was whether there were people there and what allegiance they had. There were no people there. So this was a no man's land. It was a no man's land through most of the 20th century. Um, and then things changed. Why? Because the law of the sea treaty was being negotiated, and people thought they could get seabed resources by claiming these rocks and reefs and islands. So it all began with a guy named Tomas Loma, a very fine Filipino lawyer in Manila, who in the mid-1950s looked out at the spread of the islands and saw that there was nobody there. And so he went out and asserted a claim on behalf of a new country called Freedom Land, the only purpose of which was to issue postage stamps, which he made a fortune on. And in 1972, the late Ferdinand Marcos, the dictator of the Philippines, jailed him and at bayonet point forced him to transfer all of his rights, whatever they were, uh, to the Philippine government. That's the origin of the Philippine claim. 1978, the Malaysian military went and seized five islands. There are 48 Vietnamese outposts there. The Chinese in 1987, after all this had happened, belatedly reacted. I think what they did was two things. First, like in a game of Go, Wei uh, Qi, where you, you place stones to break and encircle them, and to establish a presence that can't be dislodged, they went and took seven islands and enlarged them. And being Chinese, when they enlarged things, they made it really large. Um, so uh, Vietnamese and Filipinos have been doing that before, but on a small scale. Um, so that's the first thing. We're here, you can't throw us out. 
our claim, which dates, the Chinese claim, dates at least a century back, uh, more than that actually, 1914 was the first map showing the claim. Um, the, uh, we're here and you can't throw us out. Um, and um, nobody can throw them out. The second purpose is, if you look at Chinese history, for 600 of the last thousand years, China was ruled by foreigners. And foreigners, the last 500 years, came right through that area. This is a picket line out there, in the military sense, not the trade union sense. Um, warning. You know, if you're coming at me, I'm going to find you, and I'm going to see it, and I'm going to stop it. Um, the United States has no claim at all in these islands. We never claimed that we were in the Philippines as the colonial power. Um, and uh, they're not off our shore. Uh, so it, I find it really quite remarkable that we managed to achieve the level of hysteria about this at the end. Um, it's very dangerous. As I said, we can get ourselves into a war over this. I don't think the American people want to fight over a bunch of sandbars in the South China Sea. Um, so, you know, before you start a war, you ought to be confident that you can sustain it. And you also ought to have a war termination strategy. Where does this end if you get into a war? Are we going to annex those islands? Put Marines on them? I don't think so. So I think we need to think this through a little more soberly than we've done. Um, this is a lot of testosterone being burned in the sea as people go at each other. Thank you very, very much.